In a stunning endorsement, Pope Francis is now endorsing civil unions to protect same-sex couples around the world. Now, the Pope supported civil unions when he was an archbishop, but now, of course, he's the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, and his stance is very different from where the church has stood. WBC's Bill Shields is live for us tonight in Boston at the Cathedral of the Holy Cross with Reaction. Bill? Dave, you know, Pope Francis is a very interesting study. One minute, he's a very independent thinker, independent of the church. The next minute, he strictly follows church dogma. So this step is a very big one. At times, Pope Francis has shown his progressive side, but on other issues, he follows church doctrine. But today's announcement shook the roots of the Catholic Church. Civil unions for same-sex couples should be the law. Uh, it's been a long time coming for many Catholic LGBTQ Americans. The executive director of the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation says it's about time. It's in line with the growing support across the nation. Five years after the Obergefell decision was issued from the U.S. Supreme Court, two out of three Americans support marriage equality. It is clear and blatant Catholic teaching that we are to have regard for the dignity of every person and one's sexual orientation. Dr. Ernest Kalamati is a Regis College professor of theology. He says it was not a total surprise that Pope Francis is now supporting civil unions because he chooses to recognize the difference in people. But he also is very clear about the heart of the gospel. And the heart of the gospel is the inestimable value of every human being. So what this amounts to, in effect, from the Pope is a ringing endorsement of civil proceedings and protection, if you will. A dramatic change for the Catholic Church. Pope Francis is calling for same-sex civil unions to be protected by laws. The pontiff's remarks came in a new documentary called Francesco that premiered earlier today in Rome. During an interview for the film, the pontiff said in part, homosexual people have the right to be in a family. They are children of God. 12 News reporter Chelsea Jones has reaction from Providence. Bishop Thomas Tobin of the Providence Diocese released a statement in response to the Pope's announcement in support of equal rights for all, but not necessarily same-sex civil unions. However, one woman I spoke to says the Pope's move is long awaited by many. Pope Francis calling for the reversal of Vatican doctrine and a long lineage of predecessors saying same-sex civil unions should be protected by law. I think as a previous person of the faith, it's terrific to see. That this coming after the Italian release of Francesco, a documentary following the Pope's life and ministry. In it, he says homosexual people have the right to be in a family. They are children of God. You can't kick someone out of family nor make their life miserable for this. Bishop Thomas Tobin of the Providence Diocese giving us this statement that reads in part, the Pope's statement clearly contradicts what has been the long-standing teaching. The church cannot support the acceptance of objectively immoral relationships. Relationships. Families come in all shapes and sizes. Bishop Tobin goes on to say individuals with same sex attraction are beloved children of God and must have their personal human rights and civil rights recognized and protected. Pope Francis has endorsed same sex civil unions. The endorsement was made in a documentary film that premiered at the Rome Film Festival today. Megan Williams is in Rome with more on the film and what the Pope said. This is the clearest the Pope has ever been on this issue. We know that he's both that has been uh, expressing some of the positive positive but he says that uh, gay people, LGBT people, have the right to be protected by civil unions. He says they're children of God, and as such, they need that kind of protection. He says he stood for it before, and he's referring to the Bishop of Buenos Aires. He, he, he came out in favor of some sort of civil union for gay people. He was against gay marriage, uh, but he says that gay people, same-sex families, have a right to be a family just like everybody else. Action to this, Megan, been among uh, Catholic Church members? Well, obviously, I mean, I've spoken to several uh, representatives of uh, LGBT Catholic groups. They're elated. 
Um, they say that this is the, you know, a, a step towards full recognition that they've been fighting for within the Catholic Church. Um, it, observers, Catholic observers say that uh, this really isn't a big deal in countries like Canada and the United States and much of Europe, where there are civil unions and marriage uh, for same-sex couples. But this is a big uh, message to other parts of the world, uh, particularly countries in Africa and other countries where being gay is still illegal. So this is a strong message. And they say it's going to reverberate throughout the Catholic Church and those countries uh, that where there are many Catholics, where uh, the same sex relationship is still considered uh, something not acceptable. In a stunning turn of Vatican doctrine, Pope Francis is endorsing same sex civil unions for the first time. Joe Holden joins us now to explain how local Catholic scholars say the pontiff's statement is deeply complicated. Joe, good evening. Yuki, indeed, it is deeply complicated. Good evening to you. And for an unknown number of Catholics, this news comes as encouraging, but no surprise. But others are questioning how we are learning about it through a documentary. And critics say the Pope does not use documentaries to offer teachings on religion or morals. Marking a first as Holy Father, Pope Francis has made an endorsement of civil unions. His remarks came in an interview for Francesco, a documentary that premiered earlier today at the Rome Film Festival. The Pope said, quote, homosexual people have the right to be in a family. They are children of God. He continued, what we have to have is a civil union law. That way, they are legally covered. Dr. Massimo Fagioli, a Roman Catholic Church historian and professor of religious studies at Villanova University, says any interpretation the Pope's new statement reverses long-held church teachings is deeply complicated. The Catholic Church is now in this uh, age of uh, transition from a negative uh, language on, on homosexuality and a more positive, more more pragmatic uh, approach to it by Pope Francis. Francis has previously supported civil unions as Archbishop of Buenos Aires. His remarks in the documentary shift the church away from his conservative predecessors. Mark Siegel, a Philadelphia LGBT activist and pioneer, applauded the pontiff's position. For those of us who have followed this pope, I don't think it's a very big surprise. The spokesman for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia said to me it was unclear if Archbishop Nelson Perez or the Archdiocese of Philadelphia as a whole would have anything to say on these statements made by the Pope. But a policy director with the Archdiocese of New York, his name is Ed Meckman, described this as a mistake by a man with good intentions. He went on to write in a uh, by our, or a, a piece this afternoon, it was an unforced error and it will have to be corrected either by the Holy Father or by his press team. That's the latest. Reporting live in Broomall, this is Joe Holden, CBS. Father Martin, welcome back to the program. Obviously, this is a good day for you. You've been lobbying um, the Pope for this, uh, and you've been wanting to see something like this. Tell me exactly what the Pope has done. Has he broken from official doctrine? Has he created something new? Is he just clarifying views? What's going on? I think he's creating a new space uh, for LGBT people. Um, there is a 2003 document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, against same-sex unions, and the Pope is obviously saying he uh, sees things a little differently. Uh, it is, it's, it's, it's momentous because he's saying it as Pope. He said it before as Archbishop of Buenos Aires. He's saying it on the record, uh, and he's being very clear. It's not simply he's tolerating it, he's supporting it. So. What does it mean in practice, do you think? Because I'm going to go back to what you, you mentioned about 2003, and then, of course, his predecessor, Pope Benedict, had some very different things to say about this issue. And we know that there is a struggle within the church hierarchy over how far to go with reform versus traditionalism. Well, I, I think one thing it says is that uh, the, the bishops, um, who are many in different countries, who are uh, sort of uh, violently against uh, civil unions are going to have to rethink their positions. You know, you often have bishops in the United States and, and especially in places like Poland who say that they are a threat to traditional marriage. Now you have the Pope saying he supports them, and so they're going to have to rethink what they're talking about. And I think on a 
a broader level, it basically is a, a more of a welcome mat for LGBT Catholics, make them feel more welcome in their church. There's, there's quite a lot to unpack because obviously the Pope has been saying that. His very first comment on this when asked about um, gay rights was, who am I to judge? And that went all over the world. It became a slogan. It was viral. So he, he's, he's sort of been moving in that direction ever since. But certainly here in the UK, the Catholic Church, the Cardinal has, I believe, also endorsed the idea of, of same-sex unions. Same happened in Argentina, which is the home land, the homeland of the Pope. When he was cardinal, though, he had a different view on all of this. And he then basically said, OK, well, same-sex unions staves off the idea of same-sex marriage. Can you unpick all of this for us? Well, I think it, it seems like the church is understanding LGBT people and perhaps reflecting on their experience of, of being in, in civil unions, of, of being in partnerships like that. And, he may have changed his thinking, uh, and he may just have had more experience of talking with LGBT people. He has, I know, you know, for a fact, he has friends who are LGBT. He speaks to them. Um, you know, I, I spent a half an hour with him uh, last year uh, speaking about LGBT issues, so he's well-informed, and he may have, in a sense, as we say in the church, developed his own doctrine, right? He, he's sort of come to an understanding of things in a different way, which enabled him to speak more positively in this documentary. Uh, as you know, the official doctrine in the church still considers and states in black and white that homosexuality is a disordered state. Um, uh, I believe Pope uh, Benedict went further and, and, and you know, uh, aligned it with the work of the devil and such. There is a very strong conservative group in the Vatican, and they have been pushing back on many other of the Pope's efforts at reform in other areas. You've talked to him about this, I said, and we have a picture of you with him. How has he talked to you about how he's going to manage this? Well, I can't reveal what he said uh, to me in the meeting. He asked me to keep it private, but I would say that, you know, he was very open and very warm, and you don't have to know what he said to me. Just look at what he's saying today. Uh, he has been speaking very warmly about gay people. He's the first Pope to ever use the word gay, uh, and I think what he's trying to do is take a more pastoral approach. I mean, we have to reckon with the fact that uh, the head of the church has now said that he feels that civil unions are okay. Uh, and we, we can't dismiss that. And I know you're not trying to, but I think uh, bishops and other people can't dismiss that uh, as easily as they might want to. This is, in a sense, this is a kind of teaching uh, that he is giving us. Certainly, we're not dismissing it. We're all for progress um, and human rights, obviously. But I, I'm asking you in the context of the very real opposition, for instance, in the wider church in Africa, where you know whether it's in the Catholic or the, the wider Christian community, um, it's very heavily condemned. Even governments there condemn um, homosexuality on pain of death and torture and imprisonment. How do you think it's going to you know, filter down into those communities? I think that's a great question. I mean, places in sub-Saharan Africa, even places uh, like Poland, uh, where the bishops are violently anti-LGBT, I think it's going to be a real challenge for them. And, uh, you know, we can't mince words. I think it's going to be really shocking for a lot of these uh, bishops to hear this. You've already had a bishop in the United States come out against it, uh, you know, within the last hour or so. So it's a real challenge. But, you know, Pope Francis is encouraging us to see LGBTQ people as our brothers and sisters, and he is always reaching out in a pastoral way, and this is what got Jesus in trouble too. So he's, you know, he has, uh, he's in good company. What about the idea that the, the Pope is also, I mean, he's talking more and more about these human rights issues and, and these humanitarian and pastoral issues and compassion. His new encyclical, you know, condemns, I think, what he calls a myopic vision, and I think he uses the word cruelty. He's spoken out against what he calls cruelty against um, children who are being separated at the U.S. border, and now we have news that more than 500 of these kids separated from their parents and have no way um, of the system trying to know where the parents are, where the kids are, and how to get them back together. Um, he's really making some quite clear, well, obviously moral comments, but also political, particularly on the eve of, of a major election in the U.S. What is his message, do you think? Well, you know, in a sense, his message is the gospel, which sometimes has political overtones. Uh, and the message of Fratelli Tutti, that encyclical you were talking about, is really that everyone is connected. 
Uh, and so we have to look at our brothers and sisters who are migrants and children, especially. And he's bringing those people um, to the fore. But I also think in terms of this um, move today, he's asking us to see our LGBTQ brothers and sisters not as the other, which is their, the way they're often seen in the church, but as our brothers and sisters. And he's trying to create a space for them and trying to reach out to them. So it's all of a piece. All of these things are of a piece. You made three and a half million dollars, Joe, and your son gave you. They even have a statement that we have to give 10 percent to the big man. You're the big man, I think. I don't know. Maybe you're not. But you're the big man, I think. Anyone who's responsible for that many deaths should not remain as president of the United States of America. Then they say the country will be wearing masks and distancing into 2022. Is your timeline realistic? No, I think my timeline's going to be more accurate. I don't know that they're counting on the military the way I do, but we have our generals lined up. He's, this is the same fellow who told you this is going to end by Easter last time. This is the same fellow who told you that, don't worry, we're going to end this by the summer. We're about to go into a dark winter. He had nothing. He did virtually nothing. And then he gets out of the hospital and he talks about, we're, this is, oh, don't worry. So we can't lock ourselves up in a basement like Joe does. He has the, <laughs> he has the ability to lock himself up. I don't know. He's obviously made a lot of money someplace. I said, you know, this is dangerous. And you catch it. And, you know, I caught it. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Great doctors, great hospitals. And we can't close up our nation or you're not going to have a nation. People are learning to die with it. You folks home will have an empty chair at the kitchen table this morning. It's not my fault that he came here. It's China's fault. And you know what? It's not Joe's fault that he came here either. It's China's fault. They kept it from going into the rest of China for the most part, but they didn't keep it from coming out to the world. He knew how dangerous it was, but he didn't want to tell us. He didn't want to tell us because he didn't want us to panic. He didn't want us. Americans don't panic. He panicked. You're the one that takes all the money from Wall Street. I don't take it. I have. You, you have raised a lot of money. I made it clear that any country, no matter who it is, that interferes in American elections will pay a price. They will pay a price. And it's been overwhelmingly clear this election, I won't even get into the last one, this election, that Russia has been involved, China has been involved to some degree, and now we learn that, that, uh, that uh, Iran is involved. Joe got three and a half million dollars from Russia, and it came through Putin because he was very friendly with the former mayor of Moscow, and it was the mayor of Moscow's wife, and you got three and a half million dollars. There has been nobody tougher on Russia than Donald Trump. We learned that this president paid 50 times the tax in China, has a secret bank account with China, does business in China, and in fact is talking about me taking money. You have not released a single solitary year of your tax return. What are you hiding? I asked them a week ago, I said, what did I pay? They said, sir, you prepaid tens of millions of dollars. I prepaid my tax. When last time he said what he paid, he said, I only pay that little because I'm smart. I was put through a phony witch hunt. The only guy made money from China is this guy. Children are brought here by coyotes and lots of bad people, cartels. We now have as strong a border as we've ever had. We're over 400 miles of brand new wall. And it was a picture of these horrible cages. And they said, look at these cages. President Trump built them. And then it was determined they were built in 2014. That was him. They separated them at the border to make it a disincentive to come to begin with. They, real tough, we're really strong. And guess what? They cannot, it's not coyotes didn't bring them over. Their parents were with them. Not they built the cages. The they, who, who built the cages, let's, Joe? Let's talk about what who we're talking about. Who built the cages, about. Joe? Let's talk about what we're talking about. He did nothing except build cages to keep children in. There is institutional racism in America. And we have always said, we've never lived up to it, that we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal. Well, guess what? We have never, ever lived up to it. But we've always constantly been moving the needle further and further to inclusion. Nobody has done more for the black community than Donald Trump. The exception of Abraham Lincoln, possible exception, but the exception of Abraham Lincoln. We have the Trillion Trees program. We have so many different programs. I do love the environment, but what I want is the cleanest crystal clear water, the cleanest air. Look at China, how filthy it is. Look at Russia. Look at India. It's filthy. 
the the air is filthy. The change, climate warming, the global warming is an existential threat to humanity. When he says buildings, they want to take buildings down because they want to make bigger windows into smaller windows. As far as they're concerned, if you had no window, it would be a lovely thing. And and what about fracking? All right, now, let me now let me have, have, let me allow fracking. Vice President I Biden to have respond. I never said I oppose fracking. You, you said it I, on tape. I did show the tape. Put it on your website. I'll put it on. Put it on the website. If he gets in, you will have a depression the likes of which you've never seen. Your 401ks will go to hell, and it'll be a very, very sad day for this country. A powerful magnitude 7.5 earthquake in Alaska. Thanks for joining us. I'm Joyce Taylor. I'm Greg Copeland in for Mark Wright tonight. A quake struck shortly after 2 o'clock, less than 60 miles from Sandpoint. That's right near the Aleutian Islands. It prompted a tsunami warning for the southern coast of Alaska with people heading for higher ground there. King 5's Glenn Farley joins us live now with an update on the tsunami threat here. Glenn. Well, the good news here is that the tsunami threat did not materialize, but it is a threat conceptually because we have seen tsunamis hit Washington state before, for example, from the giant magnitude 9.2 in 1964 that killed people in Washington, Oregon and in California when waves rolled in. That was a much bigger quake than this one is. That does not mean a 7.5 is not a significant event. And I talked to Harold Tobin on the phone here just in the last few minutes. He is the state seismologist for the state of Washington. He says that the uh, while it, that has subsided, this is a reminder of the threats that we face. This was on the subduction zone. As we have showed you many times, this is where the ocean floor up in Alaska is being pushed under the continental plate that helps form the islands there. And you can hear some of the video that we are now getting in here from Alaska right now. If there was a tsunami heading to us, we would have had several hours worth of warning to be able to clear off of beaches like this here in Seattle and especially off of the coast. But the other warning here and the reminder for us is we have the same geological structure, which is again that ocean floor forced under the North American continent. In that case, we would not have hours worth of warning, particularly out on the outer coast of Washington, places like ocean shores we may only have 15 or 20 minutes to try and get to higher ground. emergencies threatening thousands in Colorado tonight. In Boulder County, the Calwood fire broke out Saturday. This is actually the biggest wildfire in Boulder County history. Fueled by high winds and dry conditions, it burned more than 8,000 acres in less than 24 hours, forcing the entire community of Jamestown to evacuate. I feel like I want to cry, just really emotional. This time lapse shows a thick plume of smoke growing on the horizon, consuming the sky and visible for miles. You just don't know what's going to happen. To the north, crews are gaining ground fighting the Cameron Peak fire burning since mid-August. It's already scorched more than 200,000 acres, now the biggest wildfire in Colorado's history. Fire season usually ends in the fall, but extreme weather is fueling the destruction, raising the risks for residents and those on the front line. To the west now, where dozens of wildfires are burning, threatening more than a thousand homes. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z joins me live with the latest. Ginger, what do we know about these new fires that broke out over the weekend? Well, we know that the conditions have been horrific, Diane, that is for sure. Relative humidities were down in the teens over the weekend. The wind gusts over 30 miles per hour, and that's when you get new fires, like the Calwood fire that you see here for Boulder County. It's 8,700 acres burned already, only 15% contained. There have been mandatory evacuations, and watch the hills there go aflame in this time lapse. 
26 homes destroyed so far. And I say so far because between that and the Cameron Peak fire, which is just to the northwest, uh, closer to Fort Collins, this one, remember, is the largest wildfire in Colorado state history. It has now burned more than 203,000 acres. You've seen the town. It, it's been there a long time and this is the most threatened it's ever been. Colorado has never seen a fire this large get six times bigger overnight. That's exactly what happened in Grand County. I felt like we were ahead of the curve yesterday, but I still think that we need to make sure that we're even farther ahead of that curve today. Iconic parts of Colorado are under threat. Granby, Estes Park. Hundreds of people left their home behind, not knowing if it'll be there when they come back. We've all been told we've lost everything back there, but until I see, until I see, you always have a little hope, maybe. The sky is orange, the air filled with smoke, and Colorado is burning. Our state's wildfires this season are large enough to fill the state of Rhode Island. There are almost a dozen major wildfires burning statewide. Tonight, we are focused on the five you see on this map. Cameron Peak, Williams Fork, East Troublesome, Calwood, and Left Hand Canyon. We have a lot going on and you heard us correctly at the top of this newscast. The East Troublesome fire is nearly six times larger than it was last night. It's now the fourth largest fire in Colorado history. And to give you some perspective, at the rate this fire was moving last night, it could have burned through the main CU Boulder campus in less than four minutes. When you got out yesterday, explain to me what it was like. Uh, very hurried. <laughs> Grab what you need and go. Here's a look at the current evacuation map for the East Troublesome Fire. This includes Rocky Mountain National Park. Evacuations are subject to change if the fire grows, and we are tracking the possibility for high winds fueling another night of rapid growth. And we have the vast majority of the Denver 7 News team working different angles of this fire. You will hear from all of them tonight, beginning with Ivan Rodriguez in Granby. Ivan? And it's, it's quiet uh, here where I am in Granby, Erie. Even this row of houses that you see uh, to my right, there was a neighbor who said as soon as he sees smoke come over that ridge past those houses, he's out of here. And he did just that three minutes ago. A lot of the people who were here before are now gone. And there is a lot of concern that if these winds and dry conditions continue, this fire is only going to increase. The Grand County Sheriff's Office says they thought they had a better grasp of the fire last night before it grew more than 100,000 acres. We don't know what to expect, and based on what we saw yesterday, I felt like we were ahead of the curve yesterday. I will stand up here and tell you that every day, but I still think that we need to make sure that we're even farther ahead of that curve today. One woman who was forced to evacuate says she heard her home may have caught fire. You're numb, and you've been told that it's gone, but then you don't want to believe it. So until you see the ashes, then you just survive. Almost 24 hours after the town of Grand Lake was told to evacuate, latest reports suggest the fire hasn't reached city limits. Still, that's only a small piece of the picture. You have to put in perspective. No structures within the town limits have been lost. The um, but the neighborhoods surrounding the town have been decimated. The Grand County Sheriff's Office tells me that this is the worst fire this um, area of the mountains has seen ever. There's going to be, but there's about 300 fire personnel working to contain this fire right now, and there have already been made calls out to ask for more help. Again, resources are tight as the entire state is seeing wildfires all across. Live in Granby, Ivan Rodriguez, Denver 7. Ivan, thank you so much. And many of you want to know how a fire can grow so quickly. Well, this really was a perfect storm of conditions, and experts point to three factors. High wind, intense drought, and dead trees. Trees in the burn area have been devastated by beetles that beetle killed if those trees are fuel for wildfires. Denver 7's Liz Gillardi continues our team coverage tonight in Estes Park, which is threatened on one side by the East Troublesome Fire and on another side by the Cameron Peak Fire. Good evening, Liz. 
Good evening. You know, Estes Park is pretty much shut down. All the businesses virtually are closed. There's one gas station that was open when we drove into town and you can see the roads. They were clogged with traffic just about an hour ago as people tried to get out of town and now they're empty. Also, Excel Energy crews trying to perhaps turn off power. And at one point this afternoon, I had to wipe pieces of ash off my face. Because